This is a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Support for this program is made possible with your membership. Thank you. And by Brain Intercept in Aberdeen, providing screenings to identify root causes of cognitive dysfunction in a comfortable setting, offering therapies to enhance quality of life for those seeking prevention of cognitive decline and for those living with dementia. Donors to the Explore South Dakota Fund. Support the production of local documentaries and other programs of local interest presented by SDPB. Friends of STPB appreciates their support of this program. All right, Tim. Anything you want to do before we get started? Yeah, pray. All right, let's do it. I've been praying with and for my friend Tim Scott ever since he was first diagnosed with primary progressive apraxia of speech. It's a rare condition affecting less than one in a million. Tim is a savvy communicator and a business leader in Sioux Falls. He's known in the business world for his charisma, his optimism, and his ability to connect with others. He's been posting daily selfies with everyone he encounters to document his journey. Tim often says speech is his superpower. You'll hear that phrase a lot in the next half hour. Let's get to know Tim in his younger years as he first began developing this, his superpower. Tell me where you grew up. Next to St. Jacob's Church. Then we moved to a farm uh, by my paternal grandparents' place. Um, so you grew up next to a church? Yes. What was that like? Um, I had a chocolate milk for breakfast <clears throat> and watched Top Gun. And then as the church bells were ring, ring, ringing, um, we had to, to church. The church, St. Jacob Church, is just kind of like our second home. In fact, I comment sometimes that all of our family pictures are taken at the church. <laughs> The background is always a wall at the church <laughs> because we're here so much. One of the things you've been doing over the last eight months is you take daily selfies. Tell me about that idea and, and why you do it. I started on November 10th, uh, 2021. Um, I just came up with the idea myself. <clears throat> and I'm like, I'm gonna take a selfie every day until I can no longer do it. <clears throat> I wanna document my journey. From a young age, you could tell he was, he was gonna be a success in business because he was always coming up with these great money-making plans with me. Um, one of the first ones I remember, and I, again, I don't know if it, this might need to be cut, I don't know, because it involves a crime. Did you have a name for this bootlegging business? <laughs> uh, t and L. We got some cheap, cheap blank tapes and we started running off copies of, of these tapes. And we'd spend the afternoon, right, you know, hands cramping up writing the, the track listings on the tape and stuff like that. And I had one of those nice briefcase style tape uh, case. And this, this gets used a lot in our money-making schemes. Um, and we'd fill it up with, with whatever we were selling and we'd go to school and we didn't learn about Tim's illegal bootlegging business until we heard Jeff Lamberty tell us oh, oh, the other day at Buffalo Trading Post. Again, right. one of those things we had no idea. No. 
I was going to say, going backwards a little bit, one of the leadership things that I remember about Tim, he was president of our local 4-H chapter. Again, he started at an early age with his leadership skill. Yeah. Tim was was always a talker. I mean, he could always he could always relate to people. He could always talk through situations. He wasn't afraid to to go up and visit with somebody. Um, he was a real communicator. In your early days, what was your favorite speaking moment? Uh, probably the state FFA Ag Sales Champion. I was that. I sold a pride of work boots, um, and the judges said I was only, only one to ask for the sale. Yeah. So that's kind of my pinnacle moment, moment in my high school career. It gave me the confidence that I could go to college and be successful. No other person in my family had ever went to college. Tim graduated from Northern State University with a bachelor's in marketing in 1999. During his tenure, he flexed his unique social skills as student body president and became an excellent salesman at a local trade home shoe store. I was making $17 to $18 an hour in the mid-90s. I sold more than anybody else. What made Tim a good salesperson? He can talk and talk and talk. That's what... I, I'm so glad to be here doing this with you because I want people to understand what a talker he was, you know, just a persuader. And he was really good at that. And that's kind of what's being taken away now. And it, that, that's the one thing that really hits me is how he is losing probably, besides being a good person, he's losing maybe his greatest strength. What made you such an exceptional sales person? It's more than just talking. It's more than knowing a name. Something sets you apart. It's my genuine care for people. Um, people are my drug. I get a have of being my own. People. Yeah. People are my drug. I grew up in Chester, Wentworth area on a farm, close to Wentworth and Madison. Lived there my whole life. I met Jen at Cuburn class. I sat next to him and I thought he was hilarious. I was going over a harder time because she liked me first. Um, I had a friend ask her, if she'd be willing to go to the homecoming dance with me, and she said yes. So Tim, whose superpower is communication and sales, sent a designee to close the biggest <laughs> deal of his life. How does that make you feel? Yes, he did. Now that you say it that way, that sounds terrible. Um, no. Uh, you know, it took him a while to hone those skills, so we'll, we'll get him some slack. Date number two was a football game. Um, Chester played. Date number three, uh, we went to Madison and went out for uh, supper and then went to a movie. And then when the movie got over, I asked, if she wanted to sell ice cream. And she said, no, I'm still full from supper. And um, I said, Scott Rule, there was always room for ice cream because it fills in the cracks. <laughs> All right. And uh, so when was the first kiss? Um, October 23rd. And then you knew. Mm -hmm.
Jen's superpower is caring. I know he's a lot. Tim and his wife Jen have three daughters, Michaela, Caitlin, and Alyssa. They were living their best life in Sioux Falls with Tim as a real estate broker at NAI Sioux Falls, as well as serving as a board member of the Sales and Marketing Executives Incorporated and the Stockyard Ag Experience. Then his life changed as he worked with doctors in Sioux Falls and Rochester to realize his diagnosis, primary progressive apraxia of speech. I think it's ironic that I'm going to use lose my superpower, which is speech. Um, I can't believe this is happening to me. I, seeing him every day, I didn't notice as much as other people probably did. Um, you know, we just have short conversations and it's pretty casual, so he's not having to concentrate. Other people noticed him just not or, and he noticed it too, you know, doing presentations and things that things were just not as smooth as they had once been when speaking. Just oh. Good job. So I went to my primary, primary doctor. He prescribed speech therapy and a brain MRI. The brain MRI was clear. Um, six months later, no improvement. Uh, so he referred me on to neurology. Um, another brain MRI, clear. They tested me for everything under the sun. Lyme disease, MS. I have been had sinus surgery in 2018. So I went to my ENT doc and he couldn't find anything wrong. They sent me to a mail for ALS testing. I got in on June 21st, 2021. Um, so 7.30 that Monday morning, we met at the ALS doc and he's like, I don't think you have ALS. Um, we're gonna t continue to do the testing. Um, so we can check that off the list. Um, so he said, I want to get you in front of our, one of our speech pathologists. She happened to opening 9.30 that Monday morning. Within 40 minutes, she had me diagnosed primary progressive apraxia speech. So we took an early lunch and right up on it, and just went to the car and just cried. Our world turned upside down <clears throat> in a minute. Um, it was very devastating. Um, we were at May of the whole week. <clears throat> um, so, very rare, less than one in a million. They don't know what causes it. There is no treatment no here. Um, very devastating disease. You know, just like, what are we gonna do next? You're probably not gonna be able to work in the same capacity that you're working in for, uh, we don't know how long, um, but what are we gonna do with our family? What do we wanna do? And a lot of the things were like, well, we wanna do all these things, so we need to start doing them. I don't know how long we're gonna have. And the thing about this disease is we, they just don't know. People progress differently, um, have different other, other symptoms than, so we just don't know. And I think that's probably what is the most difficult is we don't know how this is gonna progress. The diagnosis, primary, Progressive Apraxia of Speech, or PPAOS, um, 
in order to really understand it, I want to give you an example of what it takes to have a conversation. First, you have language and you select the right words that you want to say depending on who your communication partner is, knowing that they have a shared vocabulary and so forth. So you select those words and then once you have your message formulated, you have to send a plan from the language center to the muscles that execute those words. So when the problem is up here with the language center, we call that aphasia. When the problem is with sending that plan down to have it properly executed, it's called apraxia. Well, looking at, because PPAOS is a problem with programming muscle execution and knowing that language is usually intact, listening to his language and knowing that he was having no difficulties with language in his work, and then going through a speech examination, which really has two pieces, a perceptual exam, and that's really listening carefully to the speech to pick up on any patterns that seem to be apparent. And the second piece is a physical examination of the muscles of the face and the mouth. And we're looking for the range of movement, making sure that they, things can move quickly. Is it one side versus another, or is it symmetric? And um, what's the strength of of those structures. And most of those movements, except when I asked him to do complicated sound sequences, were pretty intact. It's a brain degenerative disease. Um, so the top two ways are of dying are falling down and inability to swallow. It starts with speech. Depending on the part of the brain that's malfunctioning, we can predict what symptoms that person is going to have very accurately. But there's also another level in terms of what exactly is actually damaging the brain and why does that process start in the first place. And there we still have lots of questions that are unanswered. The protein must play some role because we see a reliable association. Some people think that the tau proteins directly are toxic to the nerve cells. And in that view, basically what happens is, as the tau proteins accumulate and maybe spread throughout the brain, it's causing damage. And that's why you see progression of the disease. Another common view is that the communication between the nerves themselves reach a point where it's so noisy and so dysfunctional that that damages the nerves and then the proteins accumulate as a side effect. A little bit like if you have a city that is in disarray, there might be garbage that starts piling up, but it's not that the garbage caused the disarray. That's the sort of view that the second school of thought has there. And the first one would be that the proteins themselves are driving the process. And when that starts malfunctioning, that's when you start getting symptoms. And then disease progression is really more and more of this global system going offline. I signed up for the study. Um, there are 20 people in the study. I'm the third youngest one. Uh, I asked Mayo the ages of the younger two and they couldn't tell me because of privacy rules. Um, <clears throat> they discovered this condition this disease in 2010 at Mayo Clinic, so I'm in good hands. Since then, since 2010, they have only had 100 people in the study. That's how rare it is. 10 to 15 years life expectancy. I think um, in terms of how a disease like PPOS may shorten someone's life, it is unsurprisingly not directly related to the speech problem. Having a speech problem can be really frustrating and debilitating, but it is not in and of itself life-threatening. And so typically, as the disease progresses, if people develop problems with their balance, 
or with swallowing, those would be life-threatening things. My life changed in that moment because I realized that I was a ticking time bomb. Um, I was not expected to live as many years as I'd hoped. Um, I just feel thankful that I have this lead time because heart attack victims and car accident victims don't have that chance. I also did voice banking, which is where you upload your voice to the cloud and then you download it to the tablet uh, so I don't lose inability to speak. Um, I can talk that way. Now, voice banking is the process of preserving your speech, if you will, by making some recordings when speech is still relatively easy to produce. I have trouble with my speech, so I use this computer to talk. My name is Tim. From those recordings, they splice every sound out of a number of different contexts. I love you, ladies. So 3,155 standard sentences. Um, I 300 custom. I love you, Alyssa. I love you, Michaela. I love you, Caitlin. What does a bad day look like for Tim? Well, he'll smile all the way through it. <laughs> what we notice, though, as far as the disease part of it for Tim, a bad day uh, is when we're trying to communicate with him and his conversations. There are sometimes we'll talk to him and go, it's a bad day because the communication is, is just not good. I feel both places. <laughs> my head and my heart um, because it's just so frustrating to not be able to get any words out. And I'm still able to get words out. Um, it's just that one day I know that I'll be unable to talk. I never have been mad or angry. That's just not me. I'm a very positive pers person by nature. Um, I've never been mad, but one day I will become mad. Um, so I have one day bad day to every 100 good days. You can just see him deteriorating all the time. Just every day is different. You just gotta be happy for the things that you have today and not look so much toward the future. I'm also recording recordable books for my grandkids who I am most likely never meet. Um, that tears me up inside. That you know what? Won't get to meet him that I love. Since his diagnosis in the summer of 2021, Tim continues to help the medical community understand this disease, as well as reaching out to others with a similar diagnosis. His progression of PPAOS has moved much faster than expected, and Tim is no longer able to speak. Those who know Tim well still think of him as a talented communicator as he connects us together through his journey of losing his speech, but not his character. He still does the things that he wants to do, but not probably the capacity that he'd like to do them in. But being the light of 
the room was probably his his thing. Yeah, he's he's still the same guy. I think his main superpower was more connecting people, and he did so with his speech. But I think he's doing that now by all sorts of other means. I don't think Tim needs a new superpower from me. I think he has plenty of superpowers. He's Tim's showing. superpower it was, is definitely his ability to communicate to people and, and talk through things and, and make situations better. I think that he can inspire people and make them believe in themselves as well because he believes in himself. His ability to think and his ability to, to be a, a, a real a glue in a process, but I think most importantly is the ability to be Tim. He's going to talk about his speech, but his superpower is connections. When when Tim talks to people, they they know he he's honestly listening and caring, and, and he's truly interested in the conversation and what you've got to say. I think he's enthusiastic. I think he is... Um, motivated. I think that he is driven and and wants to succeed and, and continually better himself and the world around him. He respects people for who they are, um, for their place that they're at. He's a great friend to everyone. Once you meet Tim, you never forget Tim.